Uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's state visit to the United States is now over and to get a sense of you know how this visit went relative to other uh, visits that have happened here in the United States we've got a uh, policy wonk uh, think tanker Sadanand Dume here at a coffee shop in DC Sadanand great to have you back on India today and thank you for your time compare this visit for our viewers with other state visits and other visits that the Biden administration have hosted how, how does this compare with, say, when Macron was here, or the South Korean president? Um, I think this is undoubtedly a very successful visit on two parameters, right? Um, if you look at it in terms of the symbolism, uh, the pomp and circumstance, the state dinner, the White House ceremony in the morning, uh, clearly the administration has pulled out the stops for Prime Minister Modi in a way that, um, you know, previous administrations... Uh, had I mean had, they, they hadn't done for him in 2015, for example, right? So I think that's one thing. Um, this is, as you pointed out, also only the third state uh, visit of the Biden administration. Um, there was a successful state visit for Macron and for the South Korean president also. But I think what sort of sets apart this visit is that uh, many people in the India watching community are viewing this as part of a kind of step change moment in the U.S.-India relationship where it's moved up to another level. And that's what makes this particular visit, in my view, more significant uh, than either the Macron visit or the visit of the South Korean president. I was reading some of the commentary in the American press, and they seem to be referring to India as an ally of the United States, despite uh, Dr. Jai Shankar and the Indian government furiously contesting that idea and repeating again and again that neither are we treaty allies nor do we wish to be. But for all purposes... Given what's happened during this visit, whether there is a formal alliance structure or not, India seems to have now been seen in Washington as an ally of sorts. So look, there's a difference here between how the popular press and the man on the street uses the term and how people who study the relationship and who are aware of India's diplomatic and political history use the term. Um, nobody in the India-watching community thinks that India is an ally or has any interest in being an ally. But basically, when a lay person uses the term, including a lay journalist, they're using it basically to say that, look, these two countries are friendly, they have a partnership, they're on the same side. So they're not using the term ally in a sort of, you know, strict political science or international relation term. They're basically saying that, look, uh, India are the good guys, we're on the same team as India. You've been speaking to some of the politicians here, the congressmen. Uh, give us a sense of their impressions of this visit, especially in comparison to 2015 when Modi came the last time and some of the other visits that have happened outside of the Biden administration, how are American politicians looking at what's happening? Uh, great question. You know, so just yesterday at the lunch that the Vice President and Secretary of State had hosted for the Prime Minister, I was chatting with the Congressman. I mean, I won't use the person's name because it was an off-the-record conversation. Uh, on background conversation, and I asked this person, I said, well, you know, uh, the welcome that the Prime Minister got in Congress was actually really rousing, and uh, how would you compare that with uh, 20, uh, 2015? And he uh, totally agreed with me, and he said that actually it's, it's completely true, that in general, the mood in Congress and the way that the Prime Minister was welcomed was much more enthusiastic this time than in 2015. Though, you know, frankly, in my subjective opinion, his 2015 speech was actually more engaging to an, um, to an American audience, in my view. But the response that he got um, from the members of Congress, including, you know, several standing ovations, uh, just kind of shows that the idea that India is a critical partner for the U.S., as it grapples with this unprecedented challenge of uh, rising China seeking hegemony in Asia, uh, is something that is not just you know held by a few people, but has actually percolated into the larger political class. How do you think policy mandarins and powers that be in Beijing are viewing what we've seen over the past 72 hours in the United States? This new, deeper bonhomie between India and the U.S. You know, if you're in China, you have to be concerned about this, right? And it's pretty clear that no, no one in China is going to have the courage to say this, but it's pretty clear that Xi Jinping has played his cards very poorly when it comes to India. 
Um, basically, he has taken a country that was, you know, his natural instincts were to kind of, you know, hedge a little bit and not get too close to either power. And because of his actions on the border, he has essentially forced India to move much more aggressively into America's embrace. Obviously, this is a huge strategic setback for the Chinese. Uh, and India doesn't even have to play an active role in the South China Sea for it to be a setback for the Chinese because the fact is that India has the second largest armed forces in the world and the Chinese have tens of thousands of their troops in a face-off with India and the Himal Himalayas. So obviously, the, from a Chinese perspective, they have taken one of the most important swing states in the world and they have swung it more in the direction of their main geopolitical adversary. And there's no question, I don't see any analysis that would sort of point to the opposite direction. Bad news for China. One of the key things now is how much momentum private industry can add to what the principals have set out to do. Your sense by speaking to uh, corporates and those in boardrooms here in the United States about how they're looking at India because the fact that India isn't the easiest country to do business in has been known and many of them have you know, dipped their fingers, burned their hands. Do you see there being enough geopolitical tailwinds which kind of now push more and more companies to invest in India much more than in the past? That's a great question. You know, I think the geopolitical tailwinds, as you put it, are definitely favorable to India, right? But there's also a limit to what, how much geopolitical tailwinds can affect the decisions of private companies. And we've seen moments of great optimism. This is undoubtedly a moment of great optimism, right? So to answer your question, when I talk to people, when I talk to corporate chieftains, when I talk to CEOs, when I talk to people of sort of business groupings, there is no doubt that they are optimistic about India in a way that we haven't seen for several years. But in the end, a lot of this is going to depend upon implementation, right? So can the Indian government, can Indian administrators, both at the central level and at the state level, turn some of this enthusiasm, turn some of this idea, need for a China plus one strategy, turn this idea about, you know, secure supply chains into something to India's advantage? And there, frankly, it's just going to depend on how easy they make life for businesses. Geopolitics alone cannot solve the problem because in the end, if you're in a boardroom in the U.S., you're going to look at India, you're going to look at Vietnam, you're going to look at Indonesia, and you're going to make your bet based on where it's easiest to do business. You know, and uh, India and the United States are deepening ties at a time when Russia is in a massive flux, right, with what's happening at this moment with the Wagner Group, etc. It just makes it more and more improbable that Russia would be able to service India's military requirements and therefore it's just as well in terms of uh, the opportunity for India to come closer to the US and buy some weapon systems from a far more reliable, efficient, uh, lethal weapon provider. Well, that's certainly, I mean, the situation in Russia is very fluid and who knows, you know, by the time this airs or who knows what conversation we'll be having about Russia in 24 hours or in 48 hours. Um, but, you know, going by the you know, events of the last you know, 24 or 36 hours in, in Russia, I think it seems very clear that those who have been in India who have been arguing that India needs to diversify away for its own interests, away from its excessive dependence on Russian arms, uh, are clearly having the better side of this argument. I think your breakfast has been waiting for a while. It came just when we started talking. So let me not hold you anymore, Sadhanandume. Thank you very much. Thank Pleasure you. as always. Thank you.